Hello, good evening everybody. Welcome to the Italian Cultural Institute. Tonight, we delve into the artwork of Vittorio Carpaccio, the artist at the center of the exhibition, Vittorio Carpaccio, Master Storyteller of Renaissance Venice. The exhibition is organized by the National Gallery of Art in Washington, together with the Fondazione Musei Civici di Venezia, in partnership with both the Embassy of Italy and the Italian Cultural Institute here in Washington. So thank you very much for joining us. This evening, thanks to the contribution of Dr. Gretchen Hirschauer, and who is the curator of Italian and Spanish paintings at the National Gallery of Art, and Dr. Joanna Dunn, senior painting conservator at the National Gallery of Art as well, uh, we will explore together a selection of works from more than 70 paintings and drawings, which are on display until February 12th at the National Gallery again. So if you haven't visited the exhibition, we highly recommend that you do so. Uh, we will learn about Carpaccio's great canvases for various scuole or confraternities of Venice. And in particular, Dr. Hirschauer will present two canvases from the Scuola Dalmata, uh, the appearance of which in Washington is such an extraordinary event. We will learn from Dr. Dunn more about the conservation work that was completed on some of Carpaccio's notable paintings, with particular emphasis on the National Gallery's own The Virgin Reading. She will explain how knowledge of Carpaccio's materials and techniques inform treatment decisions and help restore the painting closer to his original appearance. Without further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Dr. Gretchen Hirschauer, curator of Italian and Spanish paintings at the National Gallery. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So, buonasera a tutti, I'm so happy to see you all here, and um, as Elettra just said, the, the exhibition closes February 12th, so you've got 10, 11 more days to get to see it, so please come and see it. The exhibition on the Venetian Renaissance painter Carpaccio is now on view at the National Gallery of Art, Washington after years of preparation and several postponements due in part to COVID. It is the first comprehensive survey, survey of the artist in North America. The subtitle of the exhibition, Master Storyteller of Renaissance Venice, refers to the type of painting for which Carpaccio is most famous in his own time and still today. Local confraternities or charitable and social organizations dedicated to a particular saint or group of people were very popular in Renaissance Venice. Each confraternity had a meeting house, often decorated with a series of paintings that brought relevant sacred history to life for their members. Venice was a crossroad of Eastern and Western cultures, a diverse society, and the painter combined close observation of nature with the taste for the poetic and fanciful. Above all, Carpaccio had a rich storytelling imagination. We are fortunate to have two of his best narrative paintings in the exhibition from the series from the Scuola uh, <clears throat> San Giorgio degli Schiavoni, also known as the Scuola Dalmata. Above is the interior of the Scuola San di San Giorgio, which is still in existence in Venice. And below, of course, is St. George and the Dragon. The cycle remains in its original building with an authentic Renaissance interior, still to this day belonging to the expatriate community of the Slavonians or Dalmatians and in Venice. And I should add that this is the first time these paintings have actually even left the building. When they were uh, conserved for the exhibition, they were conserved in situ. The story here hardly needs retelling, but in the right middle ground is the princess, whom the valiant knight is rescuing by slaying this particularly fearsome dragon. The artist takes great delight in depicting the monster with its scaly back, spiky wings, and terrifying claws and tail. And one thing we noticed uh, after looking at it more carefully is that he actually has feathers too under his wing. So perhaps it's an early dinosaur, I don't know. The tail is one detail which Carpaccio didn't get quite right, as it seems to come out of the belly of the beast. 
In another version of the legend done years later, Carpaccio has corrected the error, which you can see when you go to the exhibition. The body parts of the previous victims are strewn all around. Numerous frogs, toads, and serpents inhabit the killing plain. The artist undoubtedly knew the many small browns of such creatures that were collected widely by scholars at this time. One particular foreshortened body is very reminiscent to Mantegna's innovative Dead Christ, and Carpaccio must have known this work as well. Another canvas from this cycle is also here in the exhibition, St. Augustine in his study. One of Carpaccio's most famous masterpieces, this time it shows a man of contemplation rather than a man of action. The scholar saint is shown seated in his study, looking up at slight floods through the window, a miraculous flash of light that announces the death of his fellow scholar, St. Jerome, hundreds of miles away in Bethlehem, to whom Augustine was writing a letter at that very moment. The scene provides us with one, a wonderful illustration of a Renaissance study, full of objects of learning, including an armillary sphere, plentiful books, and an hourglass. Hourglass is right in here. Small, precious objects fill the room, both sacred and profane, contemporary and antique. My favorite perplexing detail is the furry armed sconces located high on the side walls. Please. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> also in the exhibition, is the painter's compositional drawing for this scene lent by the British Museum. We should probably imagine that for each one of his narrative scenes, the painter prepared a drawing of this kind, even though the great majority are now lost. Even at this preparatory stage, he is interested in light effects and succeeds in evoking the luminosity of the interior. The artist also had second thoughts about which animal he would show sitting on the floor. In the drawing, this is some kind of a stoat or weasel wearing a collar and attached to a, le a leash. See him right here. When preparing the canvas, he at first planned to depict the same animal as seen in the infrared reflectography but then, in the completed painting, he instead showed a little white dog whose attention is also focused on the miraculous vision. In the infrared, which goes beneath the paint layers, you can see he started out doing the same weasel, this is underdrawing, but then covered it over and painted in the dog. The American Foundation Save Venice is sponsoring the cleaning and restoration of all nine canvases from this confraternity, and I would like to thank them for their generosity and assistance with these and other Venetian loans. In the exhibition, there are just two canvases from the Scuola degli Schiavoni, but we have managed to reassemble all six of another cycle dedicated to the life of the Virgin Mary painted for another confraternity of expatriates from the other side of the Atlant Adriatic, the Albanians. We are also fortunate to have in the exhibition another major example of this type, from a fourth narrative cycle, this time showing scenes from the life of St. Stephen. Here, the deacon Stephen is seen being ordained as a Christian priest by the apostle Peter dressed in gold and blue on the steps of the temple in Jerusalem, which looks more like a Venetian church. At left, a small pagan temple contains a crumbling ancient statue. And in the central foreground stands Castel Sant'Angelo in Rome. Is this then an ideal Christian city founded on the ruins of the pagan world? And this is uh, St. Peter in gold with his uh, keys, Stephen. Over here is a, a, a ruin of a temple, and the, this sort of Venetian church, Hebrew temple in Jerusalem, and then, of course, Castel Sant'Angelo in the back. Women stand behind Stephen wearing sumptuous dresses adorned with pearls and brocade sleeves and collars. 
One of them wears earrings typical of Jewish costume, and three wear brimless hats known as tartures. Behind them, men wearing Ottoman turbans are engaged in discussion, while another male in a red, orange, French cloak and elongated brimmed hat stands in profile. This figure is taken from Pisanello's famous 1438 portrait medal of John Paleologus, the penultimate emperor of Byzantium, who attended councils in Florence and Ferrara in 1538 and 1539. At right, a young boy shows his dog a flower, while a melancholy older woman or widow sits with her hand on her chin, and a pilgrim or traveler with his staff, pilgrim's hat, and water holder gazes up intently at St. Stephen. So um, this is the John Paleologus figure. And then over here, we have the boy, the widow, and the traveler. And of course, we have to have uh, the red parrot right in the middle, which we don't really know what that's about. He liked parrots, clearly. This mixture of cultures may represent those who will be converted to Christianity by the preaching of St. Stephen, and the child, wid widow, and traveler represent those who are cared for by the confraternity. A scroll at the bottom right-hand corner is inscribed with the painter's name and the date, 1511. With its display of exotic costumes, fanciful architecture, and animals, this rather large canvas is again typical of the kind of painting for which Carpaccio has always been most famous. Although this and other examples just seen will beautifully illustrate the painter's large-scale work destined for the meeting houses of devotional confraternities, the majority of works in the exhibition are not of this type, but are smaller, and were originally intended for the more private spaces of the home. The Madonna on the left by Carpaccio is from the Stadel Museum in Frankfurt. The half-length Virgin and Child was by far the most popular of all subjects for private devotion in 15th century Venice, made so by its greatest exponent, the painter Giovanni Bellini, a generation older, but he remained alive through most of Carpaccio's lifetime. On the right is, the, is Bellini's Davis Madonna from about 1460, now in the Metropolitan Museum. As in Carpaccio, the Virgin is shown with her hands in prayer as a standing behind a marble ledge with a view of a landscape in the distance. But Bellini's Virgin is sorrowful, even tragic, and the fact that the child is naked and asleep reminds us of his future self-sacrifice and death. Carpaccio's child <clears throat> is not only clothed, but is dressed like a wealthy little Venetian boy with a jeweled cap, coral necklace and bracelet, embroidered neckline and sleeves, and fancy little shoes. He is also seen busily leafing through an expensive illuminated manuscript. The charming intimacy of the scene is further enhanced by the presence of Jesus' cousin, the child Baptist, holding a thin red cross. This is not to say that Carpaccio doesn't take his Christian subject matter seriously. Although the effect is less deeply spiritual than that of Bellini, it may well be that Carpaccio's approach encouraged just as much sympathetic engagement with the holy figures, if not more. Another highly original take on the traditional subject of the Madonna is the National Gallery's own Virgin Reading. By itself, you might think that this is just another female saint, since she is shown in profile and wearing a dress and turban <clears throat> that have elements of contemporary Venetian fashion, of a kind that we would not usually expect in an image of the Virgin Mary. But the recent conservation treatment by Joanna Dunn reveals the real story of the image, and Joanna will speak about this next. Although we surmise that Madonnas and other modestly sized religious subjects were painted for the home, or rather private palaces, we know regrettably little about how they were displayed. Some were thought to be displayed high on a wall to give a sense that the Madonna was watching over them, the inhabitants of the home, while others were considered to be actual holy images that could provide real protection. But not all were hung high. 
If so, much of the detail in the Frankfurt Madonna would have been wasted, and a low placing would also have been appropriate if, as was recommended by the clergy, the image was used by a mother to instruct her children in the basics of Christian religion. In this case, the representation of the holy children engaged in the perusal of a devotional text was perhaps meant to provide a model of good behavior for the children of Venice, and also a way to teach children to read. A low placing would certainly have been necessary for the proper contemplation of a much more detailed and sophisticated devotional image. The Meditation on the Passion of Christ is in New York and is one of the supreme masterpieces in the exhibition. This work does not really depict a story, but is full of narrative elements. At the center is the dead Christ, naked and showing the wounds of the crucifixion. Yet he is not a limp horse, but is seated and seems about to wake up again. The accompanying figures, the 4th century hermit and cardinal St. Jerome at left, and Job from the Old Testament at right, right, both of whom likewise endured terrible physical suffering, are also semi-naked and seem to be pondering the mystery of Christ's passion and resurrection. Jerome on the left with his outward gaze, gaze serves as a mediator between the unfolding scene and us, the viewer. In the book of Job in the Old Testament, Job foretells the coming of Christ with the words, I know that my Redeemer liveth. The surrounding landscape is packed with detail, including several birds and animals. Sometimes with Carpaccio, one feels that animals are just picturesque accessories, but here they are certainly symbolic, complementing the religious meditation in the foreground. The innocent deer at the top left is being attacked by a hungry leopard, which must surely refer to Christ being put to death by his enemies. The red parrot, seemingly a favorite of the artist, can signify eloquence, as would be fitting in this scene. And a bird, or the soul of Christ, over the decaying throne, ascends into heaven. <clears throat> it is difficult to know the intended context for such a picture. Some scholars think that it may have been a small altarpiece, or a church, or a confraternity. On the whole, this seems unlikely, but it is still hard to guess where in a private palace it might have been placed, whether in a bedroom or study, or in a semi-public space of a room known as the portego, that is, the large, well-lit reception room on the main floor. Here are a couple of examples, Casa Gredo and also Carrezzonico, with their long rooms and big windows on one end looking out to the Grand Canal. It was this room that became the usual show place or discussion place for paintings during the course of the 16th century, and maybe that was already true for medium-sized works by Carpaccio. For example, the National Gallery's own Flight into Egypt, Egypt depicts the well-known story from Matthew's Gospel, in which Joseph leads the Holy Family out of Israel to safety in Egypt, fleeing Herod's decree. With its emphasis on the protective role given by the head of the family to his wife and child, this image would obviously have been ideal for a domestic context. Such scenes, including Joseph, were particularly popular in Venice at this time. Carpaccio uses this story of quick escape to showcase his ability to create beautiful crystalline fabric, as well as the contrasting soft fur of the donkey. And as we have seen time and again in his paintings, the artist takes every opportunity to include water and the varied boats that are always present. And there is just a little uh, commercial gondola that you probably would not have seen in Egypt. But not all of Carpaccio's domestic paintings are religious in subject. And there is also plenty of evidence that in this period, devotional images were often placed side by side with profane subjects. This is also in part true of this trio of small scale scenes, which must have certainly decorated furniture. These three allegories, which unfortunately we did not exceed in tracing one of them, so there are only two in the show and hence the black and white photo, 
You may be surprised to hear that the willowy youth wearing a doublet and hose and a feathered cap in the middle image is almost certainly meant to be Hercules, making a choice between virtue and vice. Of course, he chooses virtue, as should the members of the Venetian family who originally owned the panels. One of the most famous paintings, or rather two paintings in the exhibition, was again certainly originally incorporated into a piece of domestic furniture, or rather furnishing, since it seems to have decorated a door. Two Women on a Balcony is lent by our partner institution, the Carrer Museum in Venice. The subject is intriguingly mysterious. Two women, apparently Venetian wives, are seen sitting on a balcony, looking decidedly bored, surrounded by dogs and birds. Dogs can be considered as symbols of fidelity, and the two turtle doves refer to marital harmony. Some years ago, the scene of fishing and fowling in the lagoon came to light, and it was determined that the grain of its wood panel, as seen in X radiographs, matched that of the two women. They were originally painted on the same piece of wood and then were sawn apart, probably in the 18th century, to make two saleable paintings, not just one. Originally, the scene of men hunting on the Venetian lagoon was to be seen above and beyond the women on their balcony. And one of the major achievements of the exhibition is the opportunity to see the two panels re reunited, if only temporarily. Before the female scene was connected with the Getty painting, it was thought by many that the women were courtesans, with their revealing necklines and rich jewelry. A pair of tottering red chopines, or chopini in Italian, are seen at left. Right here. We know that a higher platform form shoe conferred the greater status on the wearer. Instead, these women are clothed in normal but sumptuous fashionable dress of the 1480s and 1490s. And indeed, these women and their finery were reproduced on Myolica from this time. The two halves make for a surprisingly tall and narrow panel, but the explanation is that it formed the right half of a folding door used to separate rooms or spaces, as seen in this reconstruction with the lost left side and the backs also presumably painted. The realization that the scene on the lagoon is complementary to that of the two women helps understand the subject, but still does not fully explain it. Clearly, some sort of contrast is intended between the bored women stuck at home and their menfolk having a fun day out on boats. But what sort of moral we are supposed to draw from this still remains unclear. Another type of picture that Carpaccio painted for the home is the portrait, usually a member of the family. One of the most spectacular paintings in, in the show, and indeed in all the Renaissance, is this portrait of a young knight from the Tissen collection in Madrid. It is probably not a portrait after all, or at least it represents a highly idealized image of an individual, perhaps commissioned as a posthumous commemoration of a young member of the family killed in battle. At this date, 1510, real living people were not represented in full length in Venetian portraiture, although there was a tradition of commemorating military heroes in full length in sculpture. The intricate, sometimes con conflicting interpretation of this image, with its profusion of plants, animals, and birds, many of which have been intended to carry some symbolic meaning, is difficult to decipher. The white ermine and white lily on the left can be seen as symbols of purity. The inscription on the piece of paper reads, Malo mori quam podari, which loosely translates as death before dishonor, referring in part to the legend that a white ermine would gladly face death before sullying himself with dirt. Of course, this is also appropriate to the fallen young knight. The toads emerging from the water, one of them looking directly at us, the heron and falcon engaged in a death spiral atop, can, also sign can all signify the battle of good over evil. There's the toad here, and these are the two birds in combat. 
A purple iris with its leaves like knives remind us of the sorrow and suffering heart endured by Christ's mother at, the, at his crucifixion. The squire emerging from the wall on horseback with distinctive gold and black patterned clothing and wearing his master's helmet with his gauntlets tucked into the waistband should provide a clue to the knight's identity. And what should we make of the two very different dogs? The hound on the left, with a serene face emerging with the squire, has been called a good Christian hound, while the dog at right has been called evil, with the knight about to execute it. Whatever the intention, this dog is taken directly from a drawing by Pisanello from about 1438. Theories abound, but no one name for the knight has been accepted unconditionally. And finally, the large and magnificent lion of St. Mark is at the close of the exhibition. The winged lion is the symbol of the evangelist Mark and therefore of Venice itself, since his relics are buried under the high altar of the state church of San Marco. This is one of many images of the lion painted for government offices. At left is a view of the Doge's Palace with the domes of San Marco behind it, with a statue of the lion on a tall pedestal, and the banners and campanile or bell tower in front of it, the political and ecclesiastical heart of the city. Here is Palazzo Ducale. Here is the, uh, the domes of St. Mark, the statue of the lion, and of course the campanile here. The writing in the book says, Peace to you, Mark, my evangelist referring to the prophecy that Venice would be the saint's final resting place. Under his colorful, colorful wing at right, Venetian ships or carracks are coming into the harbor loaded with foreign goods and will stop at the small red customs house as the other ships are at rest or are departing. The island of San Giorgio Maggiore is shown, as is the then fortified Lido. Therefore, the entire Venetian fleet both merchant and military, is under the protective wing of the lion. Carpaccio places the lion emerging from the sea, its back legs in water, its front legs on land. It cleverly alludes to the, <coughs> to the excuse me, duality of Venice itself, a great republic made up of land and sea. Today I have focused on only a few of the approximately 70 works of art in the exhibition, and I do hope you'll be able to see the exhibition itself at the gallery before it closes on February 12th. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hirschauer, for this really illuminating presentation. And at this time, I would like to welcome to the podium Dr. Joanna Dunn, Senior Painting Conservator of the National Gallery of Art. And also Good evening, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Gretchen just did a really fantastic job describing the fabulous exhibition of Vittorio Carpaccio's work that's on display at the National Gallery of Art right now. One thing that really struck me when I went to see the exhibition is that the paintings that stand out and show Carpaccio's true brilliance tend to be the ones that are in better condition. I think this gives us an idea that Carpaccio is an even more impressive artist than the one we already appreciate and love today. Fortunately, a number of Carpaccio's paintings underwent conservation treatments in recent years, many specifically in preparation for this exhibition, such as these paintings of Temperance and Prudence from the High Museum in Atlanta. On the left, you see the paintings before treatment, and on the right, they're after treatment. You can see how Carpaccio's colors look so much more vibrant after the treatment because previously they'd been obscured by layers of grime and darkened varnish. As many of you know, old master artists applied a layer of varnish to their paintings. The varnish saturates the paint and makes the colors appear more vibrant. It also protects it from dirt, grime, and scratches. We know this was common practice in Carpaccio's time because the statutes of the Painters Guild from Venice, the Venetian Arte dei Pittori, from 1278, forbid the sale of unvarnished paintings. Some of the earliest varnishes artists used were made from egg whites. 
Later artists began to use varnishes made from natural tree resin, such as the mar or mastic. These natural resin varnishes were clear when the artist applied them, but with time and exposure to oxygen in the air, they turned yellow and sometimes even brown. This can be a problem for a couple of reasons. First, a dark yellow or brown varnish obscures the details in the painting. Second, paintings are two-dimensional objects representing three dimensions, and they do this through the color relationship. If the colors change, for example, by adding a yellow film to make the blues appear green, the whites appear yellow, the reds appear orange, etc., it changes the illusion of depth in the painting. Therefore, it's important to remove and replace the varnishes after they've discolored in order to fully appreciate the painting. In addition to discoloring, as natural resin-based varnishes age, they become more and more difficult to remove. Therefore, it's important to remove and replace them periodically. Since the natural resin-based varnishes can discolor within just a couple of decades, the artists knew that the varnishes would be removed and replaced. Some of you may be wondering how we conservators remove the discolored varnishes. In historic times, conservators used bread soaked in wine, which, although it sounds tasty, probably wasn't the safest or most effective method. So today, we use small cotton swabs and mild solvents. We're careful to do solvent tests to be sure the solvents will not affect the paint. If we focus here on temperance, you can see from this photo taken during the treatment that the painting had a significant amount of discolored retouching from a previous restoration covering old abrasion in the sky. The buff colored areas that you see are the areas where the paint's actually miss missing and we're seeing the preparation layer or gesso. So I'm talking about all of these sort of pan areas that are most prevalent in the sky, but also in the water. So that's all missing paint. Once the abrasion was filled in, or in-painted as we call it, you can see how it pulled the painting together and made the figure really stand out. And you can see the after-treatment photo on your right. In-painting is the term conservators employ because we use tiny brushes to fill in only small areas of lost paint. We don't cover any original paint. We're also careful to use paints that are not the same as the original, so our in-painting can be removed at any time without damage to the original paint. Again, here are the paintings before and after treatment. Um, oh, sorry, here's temperance before and after treatment. And I'm very grateful to my colleague, Shang Kuang, who treated these paintings from the High Museum because she provided the images that I've shown you so far today. I'm also grateful to Save Venice because they generously funded the conservation treatment of a number of paintings by Carpaccio, as Gretchen mentioned earlier, including these two from the Scuola del Nada di Santi Giorgio e Trifoni. On the left is St. Augustine in his study, and on the right is St. George and the Dragon. I'm sure a number of you have been to Venice, and perhaps you saw these paintings in the Scuola. They're part of a series of nine paintings, as Gretchen described that depict the lives of Christ, St. Jerome, St. George, and St. Tryphon. And they still hang in the same building for which they were painted over 500 years ago. The entire cycle was treated, but only these two are in the exhibition. And here we see images of St. George and the dragon before and after treatment. On top, you can see how it looked before treatment, and below is the image of it after. You can see once again how years of grime and discolored varnish obscured the painting. Before the recent treatment, it was particularly difficult to see the details, such as all the bones and body parts scattered along the ground. The cleaning also revealed the colors Carpaccio used, particularly in the dragon. In the after treatment photo, you can see the blues and greens and reds in his wings and his belly. Also, the colors in the background became more visible and vibrant after the treatment. This is particularly noticeable because Carpaccio used blues and purples to indicate the receding landscape. When those colors are muted by dirt and varnish, it also mutes the illusion of depth in the painting. So revealing the colors makes the landscape appear more three-dimensional. And here we see St. Augustine in his study before treatment on the left and after treatment on the right. As Gretchen described, this painting depicts a story from the life of St. Jerome. St. Augustine had begun writing a letter to St. Jerome when a light appeared and he heard Jerome's voice telling him that he had just died. In Carpaccio's depiction of the scene, he chose to represent the transcendence of St. Jerome's soul with light flooding the room. While we could see this light before the recent treatment, it was not nearly as dramatic because it was dimmed by years of grime and discolored varnish. 
In the after treatment pic image on your right, it lights up the entire room. You can see the light coming in through the windows and making a pattern on the floor. And it's even reflected in St. Augustine's eyes, as you can see in this detail after treatment. So I think you can all see the little glint of light in his eye. Another painting that's in the exhibition that was recently treated is the spectacular painting of the young knight and the Museo Tissim Bornemisa in Madrid. And you see it before treatment on your left and after treatment on your right. I actually saw this, this painting in person before the recent treatment, and the condition did not strike me as particularly poor. But once the conservators at the Tissim treated it, it was obvious how discolored the varnish had become and how that was changing the color relationship and the perception of depth in the painting, just like in St. George and the Dragon. It was also obscuring the vibrancy of some of the details, like the blue-purple iris by the knight's knee. As part of this treatment, the conservators and scientists at the Tyson analyzed their painting to learn about the materials and techniques Carpaccio used to create it. They even had a small little installation about their treatment and what they learned. Many of the other paintings were also analyzed as part of their treatments, and the information that was gleaned from this analysis helped us to learn a lot about Carpaccio's materials and techniques. Ultimately, much of this information helped me to conserve the painting that I'm going to focus on for the remainder of my talk this evening. That painting is the Virgin Reading in the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And here's an image of how the painting looked before I began treating it. The National Gallery of Art has two other paintings by Vittorio Carpaccio in its collection, The Flight into Egypt and Madonna and Child. Both The Flight into Egypt and Madonna and Child were treated in the 1990s. But the Virgin Reading had not been treated since 1937, at the time of its acquisition by Samuel H. Kress, and two years before it entered the collection of the National Gallery in 1939. One of the reasons no one wanted to undertake the treatment of this painting was that we knew from X radiographs, the literature, and an archival photo that there was a remnant of a Christ child on the left side of the painting, which had been overpainted with a pillow and would have to be addressed if the painting were treated. And the x radiographs in the middle, and here I've outlined the edge of the Christ child, which matches exactly the edge of the Christ child in the archival photo. So you can see here he is right here, right there. But the National Gallery was planning this exhibition celebrating Carpaccio. And we could not host such an exhibition with one of our own paintings looking less than its best. And the Virgin Reading certainly did not look its best. The varnish was yellow, and the retouching from the last restoration treatment had discolored, as you can see from this detail. And all of these light areas in the sky, that's old restoration here and here, and this light area in her headdress. And then there were also small little areas of discolored retouching all throughout her face, but there's a cluster right here in her nose that I think you might be able to see. Before I go further into my treatment of the painting, I need to tell you more about the painting's treatment history. Obviously, the original composition did not include a truncated Christ child. Part of the painting must have been cut off at some point. The other part might have been damaged and discarded, or it might have been sold as a separate painting, the way the paintings from the Getty and the Correa that Gretchen discussed were. We know the painting was larger than it is now, but we really can only make an educated guess as to what the original size was. It may have been close to double its current width, more along the dimensions of the departure of sex from the National Gallery of London, or the Meditation of the Passion from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, both of which are in the exhibition. All three paintings are close to the same height. The Virgin Reading is slightly taller, but the departure of sex is 88 and a half centimeters wide, and the Meditation of the Passion is 84 and a half centimeters wide, yet the Virgin Reading is currently only 48 centimeters wide. Or the Virgin Reading could have been just a bit larger, having proportions similar to this painting of the Madonna and Child with St. John from the Stadel Museum in Frankfurt. In fact, there's a drawing at the Courtauld that shows the Virgin Reading and Christ Child on one side and a composition similar to the Frankfurt painting on the other side. And then here I'll show you the paintings, the drawings with the corresponding paintings. It's also possible that the composition was originally a Sacra Conversazione, or Holy Family in the Landscape, similar to these, Carpa these drawings by Carpaccio in the National Gallery of Art on your left and the Uffizi on your right. 
The National Gallery drawing even shows the figure of a woman reading right here. However, if the Virgin reading was part of a Sacre Conversation, it would have been a very large painting. So it's much more likely that it was another composition of the Virgin and Child with St. John, like the painting from the Stadel that I discussed a moment ago. In any case, we can be certain that the Christ child was shown in his entirety when the painting was first completed. Carpaccio was not in the habit of cutting off his figures, and certainly not a primary figure like the Christ child. We do not know when the painting was cut down, but it's recorded as a half length of the Virgin reading as early as 1797. Since that description does not mention a Christ child, we can presume it was cut before then. Here's an image of the painting during treatment after I had removed all of the discolored varnish and the old restoration paint. So you can see exactly how much of the Christ child was left visible after the painting was cut. You can see the edge of his head. Oops, go back, sorry. Um, the edge of his head and his shoulder and his arm. Um, oh, and there's a little foot too, which is really cute little pose. And all the white areas that you see here are areas where the paint, the original paint is actually missing. The choice to cut down the painting was an interesting one and certainly not one we would choose today. However, 200 years ago or more, it was not unusual to cut a painting down to fit a location or a frame or as a way to deal with damaged areas. It's certainly faster to remove areas of damage than to repair them and impaint the losses. You can see from this during treatment photo that the Virgin reading had suffered a good deal of damage. It seems likely that the portion of the painting that was cut off had sustained a similar or worse level of damage. Interestingly, the historic restorer and administrator, Pietro Edwards, who cared for the public paintings in Venice in the late 18th and early 19th century, came onto the scene just a little too late for this painting. He advocated for responsible restoration and and encouraged habits that are now standard practice in conservation around the world today, such as reversibility and respect for the artist's intent. There, these are two aspects of our practice that I touched on earlier this evening. The reason we want to impaint with paint that's different from the original and easy to remove is because we want everything we do to be reversible. Anything we put on the surface should be easily removable without fear of damage to the original painting. The reason for this is that the original painting changes as it ages. So the paint that I put on today might match, but it might not match in 200 years. Also, tastes change. Similar to the way the Christ child was painted out in the early 20th century because it was unpopular to collect just a fragment of a painting, but now people are less concerned with that sort of thing and may even feel the mystery of the partial Christ child makes the painting more interesting. Either of these things could cause a future conservator to have to undo my work, so I want him or her to be able to do that easily without fear of damaging the original. Unfortunately, though, as I mentioned, Pietro Edwards' ideas were too late for the Virgin reading. The painting was already in England by 1700 and had most likely been cut by the time Edwards was working to promote responsible restoration practice. Today, when we're careful to stay true to the artist's intent and to preserve as much as possible of the artist's original work, we would never dream of cutting off a portion of the painting, no matter how badly damaged it was. Although many paintings in, throughout history have been cut down, it's a bit unusual to see a painting cut right through a figure, and a primary figure at that. Plus, in this case, it wasn't just any primary figure, it was the Christ child. <laughs> so I have a theory as to why this was the place the restorer chose to cut the painting. The Virgin reading was originally painted on a wooden panel. These panels were often made from several boards joined together. The painting's current width of 48 centimeters is already fairly wide for one board. So if the painting was wider, it was probably composed of several pieces of wood joined together. I think there was a join in the panel right in the location of the cut. Unfortunately, in addition to being cut, the painting was also transferred from a wooden panel onto, onto canvas. This occurred in 1929. When a painting is transferred, the wooden panel is chiseled away all the way down to the preparatory gesso layer just under the paint. The paint and gesso are then glued to a piece of canvas, which forms the new support for the painting. And here is an archival photo um, that shows a different painting in the process of being transferred. So I think you can see 
Here's still the wood down here, and these are chisel marks, chiseling it off. And then here's a little bit of the wood here, and then up here it's, it's all gone. So it's been removed. Because the original wooden panel had been removed from the version reading, I had to glean any information about it from the crackler patterns that were still visible in the paint and from the losses. Here again, I show you the photo of the painting during treatment. After I'd removed the old varnish and restoration paint, but before I had applied any new impainting. So you can see there's a large vertical area of loss on the bottom half of the right side. And I'm talking about this section right here. That probably corresponded to a split in the wood. That, along with the vertical crack pattern in the paint, indicates to me that the original wooden panel had a vertical grain. So any joins would likely have been vertical as well. Often, different pieces of wood move away from each other and then back together again as they expand and contract with changes in temperature and humidity. This can cause the paint to crack and flake off along the join. So if you see a straight line of paint, running, of, of paint loss running the entire length of a painting, that usually indicates the presence of a join. In this case, I saw no evidence of a join anywhere in the painting. Therefore, it would make sense that there had been a join in the location of the cut. It's much easier to cut down a panel painting by splitting apart the boards than by sawing through the wood. If the cut was not made along the join, it seems odd that the restorer would not cut off the entire Christ child. If centering the virgin had been the goal, the other side would have been cut as well. Now, some of you might be wondering why there would be a join right through the Christ child, especially if you're familiar with the Florentine practice of planning their panels to match their composition. Florentines were careful to match the direction of the wood grain and the joins of the boards to the orientation of the composition. This allowed them to use longer boards and fewer joins. Further, if there is a warp in the panel, it's less noticeable if it lies in the same, direct, in the same orientation as the composition. The Florentines were also careful to plan the joins so that these did not run right through the primary figures, because as I mentioned, the boards of the panels can move with changes in the environment, causing the paint along the join to crack and flake, resulting in losses. The Florentines did not want such damage to mar their composition. But the Venetians, like Carpaccio, did not share the same practices as their Florentine counterparts. The Venetians were not concerned with the orientation of the panel's grain or the location of the join. In fact, I found several examples of Carpaccio's painting horizontal compositions on vertically grain panels, and he seemed to pay no attention to the locations of the joins at all. This lack of concern for orientation and joins was evident in Carpaccio's paintings on canvas as well. At this time, the size of the canvas was limited to the size of the loom. That meant that for larger compositions, the artist had to stitch together several pieces of fabric. Carpaccio often placed the seams right in the middle of the figures such as in the Disputation of St. Stephen, now in Milan. One of the seams runs right through most of the figure's head. He could not have picked a worse place to put it. I believe that for the Virgin reading, Carpaccio was so unconcerned with the placement of the join, that the of the join in the panel that he placed the Christ child right over it. When the panel was cut down, it would have been easiest to split it along the join, and I think that's what was done. The Virgin reading remained in private collections until the early 20th century, and it seems that during this entire time, the partial Christ child was allowed to remain visible, and the painting was exhibited as a fragment, even though the painting was treated a number of times. There are numerous descriptions of the painting between 1895 and 1931 that discuss the partial Christ child and the fragmentary, fragmentary nature of the painting. In fact, we have this archival photograph in the National Gallery Photo Archives that shows the painting with the partial Christ child still visible. We don't know the exact date of this photo. Unfortunately, it was mounted and any information on the back was lost, which is another practice we would avoid today. But someone wrote photo by Dixon on the mounting. A little research by the National Gallery's photo archivist, Missy Lemke, revealed that Henry Dixon and his son Thomas were photographers who operated a studio in London from 1860 to 1942. Based on the photographic process, this photo was probably taken in the late 19th century. There are several different photos of the painting in varying states, which were reproduced in publications between 1906 and 1931. But the photos were probably taken at different times that did not correspond with their publication dates. For example, the Dixon photo was reproduced in 1906, and we know it was taken before that date. 
but a different photo of the painting shown on the left was published in 1912. Yet it was probably taken prior to the Dixon photo. It shows leaves on the small tree on the left and a difference in the parapet under the Christ child. This indicates that the painting was treated between the dates of these two photos because the different restorers chose to impate the damages in different ways. A third photo of the painting was published in 1914, but this one shows the treatment of the parapet to be the same as that of the Dixon photo. So I believe that the, that the photo that was published in 1912 was actually taken prior to the 1906 Dixon photo. By the time the 1914 photo was taken, we know that the painting had been treated yet again because the highlights on the Virgin's veil were no longer visible and her nose had been subtly changed. So you can see in these two, you can see these highlights on her veil, but here the veils pretty much disappeared. And then there's a little bit of a different shape. In both of these treatments, the partial Christ child was allowed to remain visible. But sometime before 1933, he was overpainted. In that year, Lionel Venturi published a photograph of the painting shown here. In this photo, the partial Christ child is no longer visible. In 1927, the painting had been purchased by the art dealers Duveen Brothers Incorporated. They probably requested that the Christ child be overpainted to make the painting more saleable. A collector would be likely to find a complete painting more desirable than a fragment. We know that the Duveen firm had the painting treated numerous times while it was in their possession. And here I must thank my colleague, Elizabeth Walmsley. She's done an incredible amount of research into the Duveen brothers, and much of the information I'm telling you today comes from an article that she wrote. We know from Duveen's invoices that Joseph Duveen paid Madame Helfer, to whom he referred as the Lady Restorer, to restore the Virgin reading in 1927. So here's that invoice. The painting was shipped to New York that same year, where it was cradled. Cradling is another practice that we, we avoid today, but was common in the early 20th century. A cradle is a wooden lattice that's applied to the back of a panel painting to prevent warping. And here's an image of a cradle on a different painting to give you an idea of what it looks like. The members in one direction are fixed in place, and in the other direction, they're allowed to slide back and forth. The idea behind cradles is that they allow the paintings the wood of the painting to expand and contract without allowing it to warp. Unfortunately, they sometimes caused further damage to the panels, such as splits in the wood and buckling. Duveen himself learned that cradles were not always successful. In fact, records indicate that after having paintings cradled in Europe, he sometimes had them recradled when they arrived in America because he, because he thought that the European cradles were not strong enough to prevent warping in the American climate. Occasionally, Duveen determined that any cradle was insufficient, and the best practice was to transfer the painting from panel to canvas. This was the case with the Virgin reading. In 1929, just two years after the previous treatment, Duveen sent the painting back to France to have it transferred by Henri Le Guay. Apparently, there were no Americans that were up to the task, so it had to go back to France. On the right, you see Duveen's invoice showing the payment for that procedure. And on the left is the invoice I showed you a moment ago from 1927. So we have these two separate invoices for the two separate treatments. Transferring a painting was the process I described earlier, where the wooden panel is chiseled away and the paint's glued to a piece of canvas, which serves as a new support. Again, this is a practice that would only be considered in extreme circumstances today, but was not uncommon at the time. Of course, today, we can control temperature and humidity in the environments in which we house our paintings. Such was not the case 100 years ago. In 1937, Duveen sold the Virgin Reading to Samuel H. Press. Press did not have the painting in his possession for long before donating it to the National Gallery in 1939, but we do have a photo of it hanging in his apartment, shown here. We have records that the restorer Stephen Piquetto treated the painting again in 1937. It's unclear if this treatment took place before or after Press purchased the painting. But Paquetto's treatment, treatment appears to be relatively minor. But it meant the painting was treated at least five times over the span of 30 years, something which was not uncommon in the early 20th century as paintings passed through dealers and collectors. A number of details about the painting were changed during these five treatments. Comparison of the Dixon photo 
with this photo from the early 1940s shows many of these changes. In addition to painting out the Christ child, the Virgin's veil was enhanced. You can see the restorer added shadowed fold. She or he has also reinforced the black trim on the Virgin's dress and outlined her face. The restorer also seems to have misunderstood the Virgin's right hand. In the earlier photo, you can see the folded pinky and lifeline. So I think you can see those. There's a, a little tip of the pinky and the lifeline here. But in the later photo, those details are obscured and the hand looks like it was turned into just one big fat wrist. During one of the restorations, the restorer also added fingers to her other hand. So you can see in this one, there are no, the fingers stop, these are the knuckles. But then in this one, the lines continue and they made her fingers longer. In addition, in 1933, Venturi described the carpet on the parapet as violet and sky blue. But by the time of the 1940 photo, it was a muddy brown. I'm talking about this area under her right here. And of course, the Christ child was painted over. When the National Gallery of Art was founded, they would not consider exhibiting the works of art as fragments. Thus was the case with the Virgin reading, and no thought was given toward uncovering the partial Christ child for many years. However, in the 80 years that elapsed between the last treatment and the one I began in 2019, the painting's appearance had suffered. As I mentioned er earlier, the thick varnish had yellowed considerably, and some of the in-painting had discolored. And on the left, you see a detail showing the discolored retouching, and then the photo on the right shows a painting during varnish and overpaint removal. I've removed the varnish and some of the overpaint from the right side of the painting using mild solvents and cotton swabs. And sometimes I had to work under the microscope to do this. And here are some photos of me working. And you can actually see the Christ child being revealed in these photos. So there's a little Christ child. And there he is there. And that's my lovely swab with the restorer's old paint on it. Removal of the varnish and retouching revealed many subtle details, such as the pinky and lifeline in the Virgin's right hand and the highlights and shadows in her dress, which had been heavily glazed. On the right, you can see the painting with the varnish and overpaint removed. Although much of the earlier retouching was fairly subtle, it changed the appearance of the painting significantly, and its removal made the painting look much more like the work of Carpaccio. While the painting was greatly improved with the removal of the varnish and retouching, the question remained as to whether we should leave the partial Christ child visible or cover him back up. While in 1937, viewers may have considered the fragment to be a, a fragment to be a less valuable painting, people today have a very different attitude. The fact that it's a fragment makes it more interesting. People want to know the stories behind the painting. And as a result of these changing attitudes and the fact that today we try to show as much of the artist's original work as possible to stay true to his intent, we decided to leave the Christ child visible. But another thing I needed to address were the very damaged areas in the Virgin's dress and the carpet covering the parapet beneath her. Luckily, Carpaccio often reused elements from one painting to another, like we saw with the parrot earlier. And in this painting of the birth of the Virgin from, from the Academia Carrera in Bergamo, he painted a seated woman that was extremely similar to the Virgin in our painting. I was able to use that painting and the drawing that I showed earlier to recreate the folds in the Virgin's dress, as you can see here. So you've got a detail from the Bergamo painting on the left, and then the painting during treatment in the middle, and the after treatment image on the right. The carpet on the parapet was more of a challenge. You can see in this before treatment photo on your left that the previous restorer painted it as a solid brown, with red and green borders. But when I removed the previous restorer's work, I uncovered subtle patterns. So you can see there's a red and gray checked pattern right here on this border. And there was actually a really intricate design in this orange area as well. I looked at a lot of other paintings by Carpaccio. Many of them depict numerous fabrics, such as the betrothal, betrothal of the Virgin shown here but I couldn't find anything similar to what was left of the original carpet in the Virgin reading. I consulted my colleague, Rosamund Mack, 
who is an expert in Renaissance textiles, and she felt the carpet resembled some early Mamluk textiles, such as the fragments shown here. But she pointed out that Carpaccio was often creative in his depictions of textiles, and he combined elements from different textiles that could never have been part of the same object in real life. For example, the delicate embroidery in the orange areas and the red check trim would never have been part of a carpet. In the end, I could take inspiration from historic textiles and Carpaccio's other paintings, but I had to create an estimation of what I thought the carpet looked like based on what remained of the original. Some of you may also have noticed from this photo of the painting after my treatment was completed that the previous restorer did not completely invent the pillow that was used to conceal the Christ child. There was originally a pillow in the painting, but the Christ child was seated in front of it, leaning against it. In the lost portion of the painting, I believe there was probably a small column supporting the pillow and the Christ child, as depicted in the Uffizi drawing that we saw earlier and I show again here. In the area circled in red, you can see a little Christ child prop up against, propped up against a pillow which leans against a, a small column. And once again, I show you the painting before and after treatment. The storied history of this painting is a perfect example of how the attitudes toward paintings and restoration affect their treatment. Today, we would definitely try to avoid many of the procedures to which this painting was subjected over the centuries. Cutting down, cradling, transferring, overpainting, in addition, our approach toward how to display paintings has changed, and that's in part due to the public's mindset toward these works of art. I hope some of you will come see this painting in the Carpaccio exhibition. As Grant should mentioned, it'll be on view until February 12th, and then it'll go to Venice, opening there on March 18th. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Drum. Uh, really very interesting work, and it's amazing to see behind the scenes of uh, the exhibition. So thank you very much. Um, now we would like to open the floor to your questions. We have time for a few. So my colleague Anna will pass around with the microphones. And if you have any questions, we're Hi, you mentioned that you started work on this in 2019. Um, so you spent three years full time. What were you, what about? Um, so no, I did not spend three years full time on it. Um, we always have lots of other projects going on. Plus COVID hit, so that slowed the process down a little bit. Um, and honestly, I mean, at certain points, you really have to concentrate on what you're doing, especially when you're working a microscope, trying to figure out, is this a little flake that's supposed to stay, or is this a little flake that's supposed to go? Um, but when I'm in painting, kind of get into a little zone, and I actually like to listen to <laughs> And she's also thinking about riding her horse. <laughs> oh, no. Great, everybody. Um, so when you were presenting um, the, uh, the um, paintings, I was wondering, because uh, you mentioned things that were not usually seen in relic paintings of the Renaissance, and uh, and and then it brought my, uh, to my mind the fact that the Pope there had been some sort of schism, and the Pope had been sent to France in Avignon, and and did that even the fact that uh, that there was no Pope in Rome allowed the um, non-religious secular paintings like Todas to actually develop quicker than in the rest of Europe. I mean it linked to the, to the fact that there were religious paintings before and not that have considerated. Well, I think if I'm remembering right, the schism happened much earlier than this, about a century plus earlier. Um, it's interesting in Venice, they, they, they have a bit of a different relationship to the Pope generally than you would in Florence or in Rome. So uh, I think they operated on a very different 
basis. Um, I think they had much more autonomy in Venice than they did elsewhere. However, uh, the Florentines were certainly uh, very interested in antiquity and uh, you know having simultaneous or having objects from antiquity and the Renaissance together at the same time. I don't think they thought that one precluded the other. Um, you know, I mean, the Florentines are were extremely extremely religious and followed the Pope, but at the same time, they were really at the forefront of studying the ancients and antiquity and the uh, the ancient uh, the ancient literature first and foremost. So, I I see how do how should I say this? I think it's only later in the church, and I'm not exactly sure when, that uh, things were so uh, siloed, or, you know, had to be religious and only, don't think that in the Renaissance, things were considered that way. Hi, um, so I know you were talking about earlier that last time that some of those stored was thirty years or even that um I guess my question is like well uh for a lot of these when would you time to store them or all or I don't know. I mean I think there are different reasons and times for paint so if it's like unstable, if the paint's flaking off, then it's important to run it as possible to get that to save that. Um, but when it comes to the more aesthetic things, like taking off your varnish, grime, um, you know, I think there's just sort of a point where it starts during the painting that starts to happen, or when that starts to happen, you get that can't fully appreciate the artist's work, that that means it's time to replace it. But it's sort of, it's a very subjective thing. It's not like, oh, every 50 years, we're painting. Um, so it's just sort of when it it gets so bad that I feel like the artist wanted to be. I will also say that often um, installations can prompt treatment. Because, for example, here we knew we were going to have their best, but also sometimes you treat a painting and then it goes back in the gallery where it was hanging before, and all of a sudden, all the other paintings in that gallery look bad, and now we've got to treat them all. Um, so, or maybe it goes to an exhibition and you see it in comparison with other work by that artist, and you realize, oh, gee. You know, we didn't even realize that our painting had discolored. Now that we see the other ones, like ours, too, and we should bring it back. I should say we're very mindful of that. When we get a request for a painting to go out on loan, we'll often evaluate it, like Pacho, say that uh, we don't want our painting to go in this condition. It, it really needs treatment. It needs to be even a simple cleaning. Uh, would, would, can make a big difference. And uh, fortunately, when I go to see our paintings in other exhibitions, which we always try to do, because you, you always learn more about your work of art when you see it in a new context, I'm always amazed at how good our paintings look. I mean, I think we do, they do a wonderful job at, <laughs> at, at taking care of them. And I just wanted to add one more thing about the question about Catholicism and whatnot in Venice. I have to remember at this point, Venice was really a crossroads between East and West. It certainly was a very Catholic society, but there was a Jewish community there. There were um, Mamluks there. There were Muslims there. You know, there were people from really all over the known world, which is pretty small at that time. So it was a diverse society. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily equitable, but I think they were used to seeing different people and they appreciated the differences. So that may be some of the reason too why well, you 
you see antiquities and you see, like in the St. Augustine, for example, there's Mamluk uh, tinware there. There are these, um, they look like quill pens, but they're not because they didn't have metal quills. But on the shelf, there are these long, thin things that we don't really know what they are. And someone has speculated that they are Neolithic flints. So they may not have known what they were, but they liked the fact that there were these odd shaped stone objects. And so they would put them as a curiosity in their study. So I think they have a lot of curiosity about other uh, cultures, and they're maybe not as monolithic as they would. Questions. Uh, the first is about process. See, how do you make erase the original? And then, curious about decision making for a child. Is that something that? Um, decided by a committee, to, you know, to discuss that kind of policy where policy now is. So um, first, the question about how I make sure I don't accidentally remove too much. So um, we test the solvent combinations for the older paint in general, or reason solvent. So. The newer paint really um, but I test it under the microscope, tiny little areas, every color, or going to like the bigger swabs. And even when I'm doing that, a lot of the time I'm wearing magnifying glasses. And the other thing we do is that we roll, it's important that you roll the swab over so that you're time. So it's like um, kind of down gently. As far as the decision about the Christ child, it is sort of a committee. You wouldn't say it's not really a committee, but it's um, the conservators and the curators, like Gretchen and her colleague Eve, who's here with us tonight. Um, we get together and discuss it as a group um, and talk about what we think is best. Uh, in general, yes, I want to preserve as much as possible uh, of the artist's intent. So I'm usually in favor of leaving that, that, that sort of visible. But, you know, if Eve or Gretchen or one of our other curators, if I was working there, they had a reason they felt like distracting, might come up with a different We probably wouldn't cover it over again with him paint. I mean, we could, but it might be something more like we um, cover it with the frame. And you know, we make a different frame for it that would cover that over. But it could be something like we do and paint it back out again. If it had been really badly damaged to the point, like once I uncovered it, if we found that the condition was so poor that it wasn't worth it to cover it, then I might have gone back to the. But it, it, is, it is a group. I have to say, I, I've been at the gallery quite a while, and I don't. Uh, recall any time when we've had major disagreements about what should be done. I think, you know, we all study the paintings, and fortunately, we're usually of the same mind as to what to do. Yeah, it, you're, we're usually all in a fair. I mean, we, you know, we disagree about certain little things, but like big things like that. And we work really together I'm very I have these great colleagues um, and they're incredibly knowledgeable and nice um, just curious what kind of materials you use that can then be taken off the paintings and then second question uh, I might have missed this it took three years to store Different paintings that are on exhibit now, or so as far as the materials go for the paint that I put on, um, paints that are instead of being oil based paints, big, um, the paints that we use today are synthetic resin, so like 
actually like kind of like plastic kind of thing. Um, and so it's pigments synthetic resin binder. And there are several different ones, but I actually prefer ones that are commercially made for conservation work. By gamble, make a lot of artist artist materials also. And then um, for how long it takes, every treatment takes a different amount of time. And no, I can't say I don't think the other ones took three years. I think actually that the prior cycle um, from the Sladomada from start to finish probably took the full. I don't, they're not finished yet. Yeah, they're still working yeah. on that. But that's nine paintings. They're nine paintings. But so. they also have a team of people working on them. It's not just one person. So, um, you know, it's it's different with everything. And you can even have a really small painting that's just really badly damaged that can take a lot longer than a large painting that doesn't have every every treatment's variable. And I think I said earlier too, my time not I did not spend three years on that time. You know, I'm usually working two or three paintings at a time. Plus uh I actually wrote an essay for the catalog for this exhibition, so we did that research and writing. Plus, conservators at the museum, we test and all the stuff that goes out, all the works for that go out on loan have to have reports. Um, and giving talks to visitors. There's, there's a lot to my job that's not treatment. Um, so I feel like it's sort of deceptive I started this in 2019 and it took me four years. It didn't. Um. Well, you also have to imagine, um, you know how your eyes feel after you've been staring at a computer for three or four hours. And it's the same with a conservator with, you know, looking through the microscope or, or looking with magnifying glasses. You can only do that so long. And so they, that's why they always have a variety of projects. And there's points of time, too, where you're waiting for analysis, too. We have a scientific research department. And so sometimes, like, you know, I'm if I can't figure out how to remove a, a varnish, I might work with the scientists to analyze it, and I know what it was made up of, and then I know better how to stop. Or if I'm not sure if an area is restoration or not, I can have it analyzed and figure that out that way. But that takes that can take months for them to take the samples, run the analyze the data. That's the other reason the project too. It might this project might be in the closet for three months while I wait for an answer. Thanks very much over here. Um I might have two questions that are more geared toward Gretchen. Thank you both for your presentations. Um, my first question is maybe a bit more logistical. You mentioned that there are two paintings in the exhibition that come from the Scuola. So were they all originally paintings that were painted directly on the church or canvases or wood on the church that's been taken down and moved into museums? Or is the church itself still quite um, intact? And are the paintings going back to the church? Um, that's um, my, yeah. Um, they're actually, they actually are in the meeting house, the confraternity which is a, a side building near the church. And most likely, they were painted in Carpaccio's studio and then brought to the meeting house for installation. You know, it probably took him a period of time. He didn't paint nine paintings in, you know, two or three months. It must have taken him time, and I, I don't know, but I'm just guessing maybe he would finish one and then, then go on to the next. Um, we don't really know for sure exactly where in the confraternity they were. There's some indication that they were on an upper floor originally, but now they are on the ground floor, uh, as you saw in the slide. So they were moved from probably an upper floor to the lower floor. And as I said, they, uh, they have never left that building that we know of, and the conservation is taking place in the confraternity just as you see the paintings, you know, on the wall. Um, and this is the first time that the paintings have left buildings since they were painted. And they will go back to the confraternity after this exhibition. I think 
that they will not be in the exhibition proper, but they will be back in their uh, confraternity house at the same time as the exhibition, and it will be kind of a, a, a you know, a side venue for the exhibition. Hey, thank you for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> I had a more technical question about the process of conservation. So suppose there's a, a hole in the canvas or a tear over time. How does that look? Is it possible to restore that part? Thank you. Yeah, um, we do do that. Um, it depends on, there are a couple different methods that tear a tear or a hole. Um, if it's small, then sometimes we might use a very small Hat, really, um, and a lightweight adhesive. You have to be careful with patches because sometimes you put on heavy, it'll actually start showing the front. Um, another thing that can be done is to find their fabric. Um, and then there's another method where if the canvas itself is still really strong, modern, you can actually glue the fibers of the hair back together again. And you can spin, you can spin the threads back together. Um, but for older paintings, that's harder to do because usually the canvas fiber itself And if there's a hole, you might even put in an insert. If it's a really big hole, you might put an insert in the fabric. In this. We have time for one last question. Presentation. I have a question. It's more general. How did this exhibit seems to be an amazing spectacle? Art coming from sorts of museums, my amazing scholarly. So let's put behind. Um, we uh, partnered with Venice with same people for the Tintoretto exhibition that was here, I don't know, was it 2008? And uh, in fact, the Venetians came to us and asked if we would be interested in doing an exhibition on Carpaccio with them. And as you know, um, after a while, you start to think of something a little out of the ordinary. You know, there's lots of t uh, exhibitions on Titian or, Tint or then Tintoretto or Rembrandt or uh, so on. So you have to think a little bit about who needs um, to be brought forward. Is there an artist, I don't want to say second tier because they're not second tier, but is there someone less known to the public that really should be better known? So. Venice came to us, um, and I was actually looking back in my emails and whatnot for this question. The first email back and forth was in 2015. And then uh, we decided that um, a professor, Peter Humphrey, who was the uh, chair of the Department of Art History at St. Andrews, he has spent his life studying Carpaccio and has literally written the book on Carpaccio. And so, and we know him well, we've worked with him on many exhibitions and in many publications. So we decided to ask Peter if he was interested in working with us and the Venetians doing this exhibition. And he said, of course. So um, things were a little slow. And then, you know, we did the Titian show, which was taking up a lot of time. So work on Carpaccio slowed down a bit, but then, it really started to heat up, I'd say, in about 2018. And basically, uh, you know, the, the acknowledged expert in the field, for the most part, knows where all of these paintings are. 
know, obviously we're always looking for the great unknown, something that no one has ever seen before, some the new discovery. And we do find there are a couple of paintings in the exhibition that are fairly recent discoveries. So, um, you know, this show wasn't normal because of COVID. Uh, it was supposed to open, I think, in 2020 in Venice, and then, of course, COVID hit. So that took a great toll on the show. Uh, a matter of money, the Venetians didn't know if they would still have the money after, you know, as COVID went along. Um, but we just kept plugging along, and it's just a it's a it's a joint effort. It's a team effort with curators. We have a, a counterpart in Venice who we work with. And we have Peter, and then myself. I sort of came into the project after the Verrocchio exhibition, which um, I was part of in 2019. So um, it kind of evolves. I would say, for the most part. Exhibitions of Renaissance and Baroque paintings take anywhere from three to five years to put together because of the difficulty of the loan, the expense, um, the packing and shipping and what. So it just starts with an idea and then goes from there. And it involves many, many people, dozens of departments, dozens of people across the gallery. We have, uh, you know, people who pack the works of art, we have art handlers who move works of art, we have people who do the insurance, we have people who negotiate the loans, we have uh, a legal team that, you know, we have to do indemnity, we have to do immunity from seizure, it's all sorts of aspects in putting an exhibition together. That's why it takes Last question. Yeah. Uh, one of them is a painting that even Peter Humphrey didn't know about. It's um, it's a, a very large God the Father. It is probably the top of an altarpiece that's been cut off you know, under under God the Father. And he's surrounded by um, seraphim, little red angels, and it's in. Um, I've never been there. I'd never seen it before. It's in a town called Nabori somewhere in the Veneto and sort of hanging up on, on the wall. And that's, that's a new discovery. I think it's also really, it's not really a new discovery, but what one of the things I really love, a lot of some of the, that, <clears throat> like, people don't want to come fraternity or if there's churches, can't get close, they're up high, and maybe they don't have great lighting on them. So, not discovery, but it's sort of their new, yeah, I have a lot of, the all Like in the, in the uh, St. Augustine, for example, everyone focuses on uh, the dragon and the dead bodies, but once you see it up close, there are all these little serpents and toads and all kinds of little creatures around. So you can't see that when it's hanging in the scrolla. Yes. Right. Some private collectors are very willing to lend. Others don't want to at all. And you, of course, you know whatever they they want, fine. That's part of the fun of it. It's part of the chase. What do you get? What don't you get? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Gretchen and Joanna. This was really, really amazing. Um, thank you all for coming. Again, a reminder, the exhibition is open until February 12th. So if you haven't been there yet, please go see it. And uh, we hope to see you again at our next event.